I am pleased to introduce orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Adam Metzler from Orthosensi Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Dr. Metzler received his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, where he was valedictorian of his medical school class. Dr. Metzler subsequently completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at UC, where he earned the Chief Resident Leadership Award, the Chief Resident of the Year Peer Award, and the Pediatric Orthopedic Surgery Chief Resident of the Year. He completed a sports medicine fellowship and was the team physician for the University of Kentucky and UK Athletics. He is board certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and currently serves as associate faculty at the University of Cincinnati, where he helps teach fourth year residents about sports medicine surgery. He is also a clinical instructor in orthopedic surgery for the St. Elizabeth Family Practice Residency Program and helps educate many of the physicians in our community. Welcome, Dr. Metzler. I appreciate that kind introduction today, and we'll go ahead and get started on our meniscal root tear uh, conversation and lecture today. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk initially about uh, meniscal root tears and I talk about the treatment and how we're going to take care of that. So. Uh, what is a meniscal root tear? So essentially a meniscal root tear uh, is an avulsion of the attachment or a, a complete radial tear within one centimeter of the anterior posterior tibial attachment of the menisci. Um, it's also known as a silent tear. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we progress through this lecture. But most of these tears are gonna be in the posterior aspect of the meniscal root relative to the anterior. Um, Dr. Laprod classified the different types of tears um, this will help dictate the treatment. So when we are evaluating a patient, um, we'll take a look at the type of tear based on the MRI. Um, a type one tear are uh, considered partial or stable root type tears. They're commonly seen in ACL injuries, and these are often left alone. Type two tears are complete tears near the root attachment point. And these tears are considered surgical treatment um, for patients who meet uh, operative criteria. Type three are uh, essentially disaster, what we call disaster tears. Uh, they're a bucket handle tear with complete root tear detachment, um, very complex, challenging case to manage. Um, and in an athlete, we try to repair these um, in an aging uh, population. Unfortunately, these result in more uh, meniscectomies and partial debridement. Um, the oblique tear into the root attachment is also considered a surgical uh, option, as well as a um, bony avulsion. So uh, type twos, fours, and fives are often treated surgically in the right candidate. Uh, type ones are left alone, and then our type threes are often uh, treated with debridement due to the complexity of them. A lot of times they won't heal. Uh, so this is a broad overview uh, of the com complex different types of root tears that can exist that help guide us in our treatment pathway, and, and Dr. LaProd uh, has classified this in these five categories. So let's talk about incidence and etiology. So meniscal root tears account for up to 10 to 21 percent of all meniscal tears. Um, um, as we're familiar with, there's root tears, horizontal tears, um, we have vertical tears, longitudinal tears, all those are part of the, the different types of tears that exist for meniscal tears, uh, and these meniscal root tears account for about 10 to 21 percent. Uh, they uh, tend to occur in a deep squatting and a flexion position like other meniscal tears. There's often a rotation component, uh, particularly in lateral posterior root tears. There's a high proportion, particularly in lateral root tears. Uh, associated with ACL injuries. So who gets the medial meniscal root tears? These are these are very uh, common in our, our population. Um, they're seen mostly in older patients in the fourth or fifth decade of life. Females are more uh, likely to get these type of tears than males. And uh, patients who have increased body mass index, um, age-related degenerative change in the meniscus, and then also lower energy mechanisms. So this patient population is almost... Con thought of as more like a fatigue failure of time, um, uh, plus the change in the biomechanics causes the patients to be more prone to these injuries. So then who gets the lateral meniscal root tears? So these are typically younger male patients, uh, more acute traumatic injuries, um, and these are 10 times more likely to be associated with an ACL tear. So uh, the presence of a meniscal root tear has been reported to occur concomitantly with an ACL injury in 8 to 10 or excuse me, 8 to 12% of our ACL tears, and about 81% of lateral meniscal root tears have been associated, um, reported to occur together with an ACL injury. So what's the big deal? I mean, why, why are we so concerned about this, this one variance of the type of meniscal tears that are out there? 
And I think the, the major problem here is these root tears cause the meniscus to extrude. As the, in, this results in increased joint contact pressures that often lead to uh, rapid development of joint space narrowing as seen on an x-ray. These can result in subchondral insufficiency fractures and spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. Um, the reality is, is that when you think about the meniscus, it acts as a shock absorber, but it, I think of it as a simple O-ring. And so when our O-ring fails, we don't have the ability to seal whatever we're trying to seal. Um, I, I like to use the reference uh, to help patients understand is when, we're, when we use our mason jars, we're trying to seal like a bear, uh, berries or jams or things like that. That pink O-ring and the lid is critical to the ability to seal that jar. If we make a little small cut in that O-ring, the whole O-ring is there. Uh, the problem is, is that once we tighten that lid down, it extrudes and pushes out and cannot seal. And that's kind of how these meniscal root tears work. And so when I explain that to patients, they seem to get it. The meniscus is all there. It's just not attached at its root in the back. And unfortunately, therefore, it cannot function. And it really acts as if there's almost no meniscus there. And I think that's that's really the big deal here is that um, is that these these tears act as if there's no meniscus. So um, it's hard for patients to understand that. I think when we use that analogy, they tend to understand that a little bit better. Um, and it's been well-documented and well-studied. There's multiple um, large studies that looked at the importance of the meniscus and what happens if there, if there is a root tear. So uh, there's a study in 2015 of 197 knees, and they looked at posterior medial meniscal root tears. These were observed in 78% of patients under 60 years of age that underwent a total knee arthroplasty. So a lot of patients who went on to a total knee replacement had medial meniscal root tears. Um, and then there's another study that observed that at five-year follow-up, patients undergoing medial meniscal posterior root repairs had better outcome scores. So the Leishholm and, and IKDC scores were better if they had a root repair surgery. And then they had less evidence of osteoarthritis progression, including joint space narrowing and kelgren lawrence grading on your x-rays. And then there was no conversion to arthroplasty compared to meniscectomy in this study. Um, as your numbers go up, you will see obviously standard conversion to total joint arthroplasty. So the reality is, is if we can fix these root tears in an early phase, um, with minimal arthritis, they're going to have a lower incidence of conversion to total knee arthroplasty or a delayed uh, need for a total knee replacement relative to what their natural history of their knee is or was. So again, why fix these root tears? So the big key to this whole process and understanding of meniscal root tears is detachment of the meniscus from one of its roots alters the normal kinematics and biomechanics of the knee. So biomechanical studies studies show root tears to be equivalent to a total meniscectomy. And again, that is hard for patients to understand is essentially if you cut the meniscus at its root attachment, even though it's all there inside the knee joint, it cannot appropriately distribute forces between your femur and your tibia bone. And obviously that then results in earlier cartilaginous changes. And so it's really important to try to use some analogy. Like I said, I, I use the O-ring on a mason jar. Patients kind of understand that a little bit better, even though that whole O-ring is there. One small cut in that O-ring prevents that uh, mason jar lid from sealing appropriately. And I think patients start to get it a little bit better. But essentially, no meniscal root attachment equals increased conversion uh, to, to early arthritis because it changes the contact pressure significantly. Um, meniscal root tears must be re repaired anatomically. So as we talk about repair, as we come up here, we need it uh, a little bit. We really need to fo um, focus in on an anatomic repair. Not everyone's repairable, and uh, we'll talk about that as well. But we want to make sure when we do repair it, we repair it to as anatomic as possible. Um, and so we can recreate those normal force distribution from femur to tibia and help uh, delay that need for a total knee replacement and reduce that arthritis progression. So this is an x-ray. Uh, this is a, a AP view. And uh, essentially what we're looking at here is our black area, uh, larger black arrow right here. On uh, the left of your screen, we can see that there is a detachment from the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. There is a white area here that should all be uh, black collagen fibers from the posterior horn of the medial meniscus attaching at the root. And if you look over here, you can see the lateral meniscal root has a nice attachment. You can even see the little fibers that are attaching uh, next to or near the uh, PCL. And we really don't see those fibers, so we uh, are immediately concerned this would be a full thickness posterior horn medial meniscal root tear. And if you look below it, what we have noticed here on the right side screen, the smaller area, we start to get subchondral fracturing of the medial tibial plateau um, with the meniscal root tear. And we can even see a little bit of extrusion. So the triangle here, the meniscus, should be 
fully underneath the tibia and probably at least a third of it is extruded outward or more medial. And so this is a really good example. What happens is we have increased force distribution between femur and tibia. And in this case um, has resulted in an insufficiency fracture. Um, a lot of uh, stress fractures are considered in your runners and your sh you know, shin splint tibia stress fractures. Well, these are really common to find these um, medial tibial stress fractures, particularly in uh, if you see this on an MRI, the first thing you should be looking for is going to be a, a meniscal root tear. And hopefully you've caught it early so you can fix this, but it's not always the case. So um, this is a really good example of what we call a shadow or ghost sign, meaning there's an absence of the uh, meniscal root attachment of the posterior horn, in addition to then also uh, being associated with a subchondral insufficiency fracture. And the little black area is actually where the, um, the, the insufficiency fracture is, has occurred. But all underneath that is the bone edema and the inflammation that occurs in the tibia. And that's where patients hurt from. That's where the major source of pain is. Not from necessarily the meniscal root tears. There's really minimal um, nerve fibers in the root of the meniscus. And in fact, the majority of the meniscus has minimal um, nerve, uh, nerve distribution, obviously. But the mechanical irritation, for example, of a radial flap tear or a parrot beak tear is what bothers the knee. In this situation, for a root tear, it's more of the force change and force distribution difference that causes increased bony pressure. And obviously the bones have a lot of nerve endings in them. So that's where you're going to get a fair amount of your pain from. So the root anatomy, it's very, very different. It's kind of neat to see where you can really see the medial meniscus, much broader C-shaped structure. So this is the posterior horn uh, medial meniscal root attachment right off the edge of the PCL. And then the anterior root attachment and then your lateral meniscus is much smaller, more true C-shaped structure, and it, it, its attachment anterior is just right off the edge of the ACL. And then again, off the posteriorly, you're right off the edge of the PCL. And uh, but you can it, where we're going to see the majority of our tears are going to be the posterior uh, medial meniscal root tears are going to be much more common than our lateral meniscal root tears here in the back. But this is a really good example of looking straight down on the tibia, uh, where you can see um, the medial and lateral meniscus and their attachment points. So challenges and hallmarks, how do we diagnose this? So, um, so lateral meniscus tears are often associated with trauma or sports injuries. Uh, most patients with uh, medial posterior uh, root tears are really not able to recall an inciting event. So um, they usually present with pain. Um, they 30% may have an injury, but again, 70% are not going to have an injury. So there can be some challenges with diagnosis and the pain can be very vague, uh, particularly again with the medial meniscal root tears. Uh, MRI is still considered the gold standard. You can see the sensitivity and specificity there below. We're really looking for a ghost or shadow sign um, where we're missing part of that attachment point of the uh, meniscus at, at the uh, posterior attachment. Um, and it's very subtle sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, experienced radiologists will pick it up and you got to keep your eyes open for these. So what are the indications for surgery? I think this is really important because um, this is well-documented, well-studied for success or healing of the meniscal root surgeries. So the BMI should be about 35 or under. Now, I will say we do push the limits of that. The, the main reason for that is the ability to remain non-weight-bearing is very challenging over a BMI of 35. And it's really important that we remain non-weight-bearing post-op to prevent extrusion of the repair. And essentially, we don't want to rip out the sutures that we just put in. So BMI under 35, minimal meniscal extrusion. So once you've taken that meniscus and once your body has stretched it out, it's, you can't unstretch it. So once it's extruded, meaning stretched out, it doesn't have the capability or ability to unstretch, if you will. And so meniscal extrusion, where it's kicking out of the joint, is a contraindication for surgery. Grade two or less of chondromalacia. So grade four is exposed bone. Um, grade one is 25% cartilage loss. Grade two, 50% cartilage loss. Obviously, grade three is 75% cartilage loss. That can be diagnosed either directly on uh, arthroscopy or most time we're going to diagnose that on an MRI. And so if you have moderate arthritis, then the surgery really is not indicated. You're more on the total joint spectrum at that point. Again, but if we can take someone who has grade two chondromalacia, minimal meniscal extrusion, BMI less than 35, and do a root repair and have that succeed, we can hopefully delay the uh, need for an earlier total knee arthroplasty and maybe buy them five to 15 years more than what was predestined for their knee pending they had that meniscal root tear. And we need to have reasonable knee alignment and ligament. So if they have a multi-ligamentous knee injury or they have a severe valgus or varus alignment, that has to be taken into consideration. Um, and so these are the things I, I'll write out for my patients and go through kind of the check boxes 
um, it is sometimes and oftentimes is a uh, emotional conversation because patients will say, well, I don't understand why you're not fixing my tear. And I'll say, well, you have grade three chondromalacia, you're in the total joint pathway. And they'll say, well, I don't want that. I want you to fix my meniscus root tear. And I'll say, well, the failure rate's too high. It's not worth doing a surgery and being non-weight bearing for four to six weeks um, when your best option is going to be non-surgical management of osteoarthritis within progression to a total joint replacement. Um, and so it, it can take some time and energy to have discussions and, and a fair conversation. I will highlight to patients, this is not my opinion. This is national recommendation opinion. And so we want to follow best practice medicine. And these guidelines are best practice medicine. So if you go over these with your patients, I think they have a pretty clear understanding, but it can take a little energy. Um, this is a really good example on the right screen. This is a complete avulsion of a meniscal root tear. And we've completely evolved. This stump should be attached down into the corner here and the posterior horn. So we're staring at a very small window. This is your femur, femoral condyle. This is your tibial plateau. This is a small biter. This is a really good example. Just up underneath here, you can see on the left screen is exposed bone. So this patient has stage four osteoarthritis within their medial compartment. And this patient is not a candidate for a repair. It will not significantly help the patient with the ultimate goal of a root repair would be to delay the need for a total knee replacement and reduce pain. The problem with this patient already is stage four osteoarthritis. So this is a patient I would not fix their meniscal root tear on. So it's good to see patients you would not fix the root tears on. Um, this patient ultimately had a debridement and debridements do okay. It may buy them a short period of time, but they're not as good as a root repair. Unfortunately, this patient's not a candidate and did not get a root repair. How do you fix it? So we're typically gonna do three anterior portals. So we'll use a passport cannula in the middle um, to allow us to uh, suture uh, for suture management as well as use instrumentation. We'll do a pie crusting on the MCL, which allows us to give us a little bit of opening in the medial compartment. We use what's called a mini first pass, allowing us to pierce the um, men meniscus. And we use luggage tag sutures, which have been shown to have um, improved pullout strength. And we want to make sure we do an anatomic uh, transtibial tunnel. Um, we usually use a single tunnel. Some people do a double tunnel. There's no difference in outcomes. And there are some peripheral pullout sutures that can be placed as well. Um, there's some uh, technical difficulties with doing that. Um, there's still debate of whether that needs to be done or not. So this is what it would look like. So these are, if we had a meniscal root tear in the posterior horn, you can see kind of the reddish area. If that's uh, torn off, we use what's called a mini passing device that has a little piercer, allows us to pierce the meniscus and pass sutures through. And this is a cannula here called a passport cannula that allows us to work through this without getting sutures entangled within the soft tissues. So this goes a step-by-step, -step. how do we do it? So uh, number one up here, we have a root tear. We use a ring curette. We're gonna, we're gonna clean the base off. We have to create a healing response so we're going to cure at some of the cartilage where the attachment point is so we can get meniscus to heal down to bone. If we don't do that, we're not going to get the meniscus to heal. Um, we're then going to uh, use our guide here, and we're going to ream a, a hole from front medial um, to posterior medial, and then it's going to create a small three millimeter hole. We're going to pass sutures through the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, and then we're going to take those sutures and bring them down to the front. You can use, either use a button or you can use a, um, an anchor. This is a video and it's a nice video here. I'll kind of animate through it here. Um, this is our piercing device and allows us to pass uh, these sutures nicely through the um, meniscus or other tissue. We can use this for rotator cuff repairs as well. And so this is our curette. This is what it looks like. And this is gonna allow us to, um, to breed the posterior uh, tibia. So you can see it's placed in and then we're going to create a uh, bleeding response here by uh, debriding the cartilage, because again, if we try to repair meniscus back down to non-bleeding cartilage, you will not get a healing response. So it needs to be dunked down into that cancellous bleeding bone. Um, I try to get exposed bone there. This is our guide and allows us to be placed from anterior medial tibia. Um, and then we're going to drill up from anterior medial tibia to posterior medial right through the area that we um, just cleaned up, because that's where we want it to be anatomic repair. This has a small uh, reamer we can see coming in the bottom here. So we're going to ream um, the tibia from front to back and uh, really just really nice animation, I think, for people to understand uh, what we're doing. And um, ultimately, the guide will come off and then we'll over ream that with a small reamer. And that allows us to uh, pass very small passing suture guides through here to capture the uh, sutures from the posterior, posterior medial aspect of the um, medial meniscal root in this case. The lateral meniscal root repair is very similar. There's really not much difference in the technique. Um, this is showing medial. This is their, our capturing device, the mini first pass. 
Scorpion, different companies, they're really all producing the same thing. Um, and then this, when you see this, when we clamp this down, it's going to pierce through and, and then it's going to capture on the top of it, allowing us to then um, pull it back. And then I'll take these and convert these into luggage tag sutures. These are going to show simple sutures and we'll repeat that process times two. And um, the little prongs on top almost looks like a basket. And that's what catches the suture as it comes through, allowing you to pull back. So these sutures here are simple sutures. I will take those and double pass them back on just like a luggage tag. So when you when you uh, ship all your luggage, you know, the luggage tag on your ID, that's the kind of suture that's been shown to be stronger, um, essentially doubling it back on itself. So again, here's a simple suture. I'll use the luggage tag sutures. They come down the front. We can time right over this button. Um, very minimally invasive. So three portals on the front of the knee and then one small incision on the um, tibia. So this shows a peripheral stabil stabilizing sutures and it's a little harder to appreciate here, but on your left picture here, looking from top down on the tibia, if we did our traditional two or single single tunnel, we would do a repair in the posthumial aspect that we can see here. And then this is a pullout suture. Um, there's limited evidence that's gonna help. It's technically much more demanding um, and it's not really standard of care right now. I just included it in here uh, and it really doesn't change anything with their rehab protocols. Um, this is a really good example. Actually, this was a Holy Cross athlete of mine and they had a uh, ghost sign or shadow sign. It was very, very subtle. This was an isolated posterior horn medial meniscal root tear, extremely rare injury to be in isolation. There was no ACL injury. It was an excellent pickup um, from the team to, to recognize this. And um, when we went in there, this is his femur, tibia, there's my probe, and his clear, complete avulsion of the medial meniscal roots. And we believe the surgery for this type of patient will change their outcome long-term because this athlete will develop rapid osteoarthritis within their medial compartment without an anatomic repair. And we have done uh, anatomic repair of the meniscus being uh, repaired back down. Uh, it's just a really, really good example. And uh, there's very good evidence that this should hopefully prevent this athlete from getting that early total knee replacement, which would be devastating, particularly this athlete, 17 years old, um, not middle-aged. This is a 33-year-old nurse. There is a complete avulsion um, back here of the medial meniscal root, maybe a couple little small, uh, what we call fascicles, just hanging on, but really nothing attaching there. Um, and then we can see here's our luggage tag sutures in this situation, and we're anatomically repaired. You can see minimal osteoarthritis, Minimal fraying, just a little bit of maybe grade one softening of the cartilage, a really good candidate for repair. This is another good example. This was a delayed presentation to my office. So she came in um, as a second opinion for a complex case because this is a combination ACL tear. So her ACL is uh, chronically torn, and this is her ACL right here. It is not attached to the, to the lateral femoral condyle at all. This is actually the PCL right here. Here's the ACL. ACL is there, but it's not attached. It's not functioning. So this is what most ACL tears do is they'll lay flat right on the PCL and they'll provide no rotational stability at all. And so she came in with the number one complaint of chronic instability. And oh, by the way, on her on MRI, I had, she had a full thickness medial meniscal root tear. You can see she has minimal osteoarthritis, if any, just a little bit of you know grade one um, medial aspect, medial femoral condyle conjumalasia, full thickness medial meniscal root tear. So in this situation, here you can see just a couple good examples. Here's live action shots of where we're doing the, the uh, curette. We're debriding the anatomic location of where the meniscus, which is right here, needs to attach down here. That's our curette. You can see we've got that, that bone exposed. We're getting ready to pass our first pass device so we can pass sutures through the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And we can see an anatomic repair has, has occurred with luggage tag sutures and a quad tendon ACL graft. So she's got a stable knee now and we've repaired her meniscal root and um, really good case. And um, if you do these on a frequent basis, they become routine. Essentially you're combining two different cases in one case. Um, you do this all at the same time, the same surgery. The only complexity to this is you need to be careful of where your tunnels are um, because you can easily converge your medial tibial tunnel for your ACL with the medial meniscal root tunnel. So you do need to be cognizant of that as you're doing this repair. And this will change her weight bearing status um, or their weight bearing status after surgery, because you're still, you need to, the meniscus root protocol trumps the ACL protocol. Okay. So post-op rehab, um, focusing on the left side, the right side is for revision of roots, which is pretty rare. Most of the time, if they've ripped through a root one time, they're probably not going to be re-repairable. 
Um, and so rarely will we have the capability to follow the protocol over here on the right side, but on the left side here, we see primary meniscus root repair, uh, double tunnel pullout technique or single bundle. It's the same thing. So there's uh, varying data on how long they should be non-weight bearing. I make my patients non-weight bearing for four weeks. This says six weeks, but I'm four weeks strict non-weight bearing, no exceptions. Starting week five, they go into 25% weight bearing. Um, and I just have them put their foot on a scale and get an idea of what maybe 25% of their, their weight would be. And they tend to kind of understand that. And then um, by week six, they can be 50%. And then from six to eight weeks, they wean off of their crutches completely. So it is a kind of a modification of, of this protocol. Um, the As we progress further along, you know, we get more into the six to nine week protocol. They can get on a bike. They want to restore normal balance, speed and distance. Um, I don't use unloader braces. Uh, patients generally don't like them, so I rarely will use them. And then we start working on phase three, which is the nine, 10 week phase and, and up to, you know, the, th the four months to five month phase. We're really working on body weight, uh, strength, resistance, resisted exercises. We don't want to do any deep squats. And I generally tell patients if we can avoid uh, deep squats, even for a year, try to avoid deep squatting. We try to keep everything at least to 90 degrees or less. So we do box squats, chair squats. We initiate hamstring activation with, with pretty moderate strengthening <clears throat> between four three and four months, depending upon how you, who you talk to, but generally three to four months. Um, and then as we progress along a little bit farther, there's debate on how soon athletes should be uh, running. They are It's rare to have young athletes to have root tears, except for an ACL injury. So when we have an ACL patient with a root repair, we generally are going to be careful about high impact activities. I try to hold them from running for about six months with a complete root repair. So if we're doing a standard ACL um, with no meniscus repair, we're generally not going to run for four months to protect the ACL. When we add in a root repair, I'm going to ask them not to start the running progression protocol for six months. Okay. And so I think that's a little bit different when you're combining ACL and meniscus root repair together. Um, so we're looking at six months is generally where I tell patients, hey, if you're a construction worker and we did your root repair, it's probably six months before you should be jumping in and out of, you know, muddy trenches and doing concrete forms and things like that. But certainly lighter duties, you can see we can progress on. The problem for most patients is maintaining that non-weight bearing status for that first month. And then after the month, then you're really restoring the rest of the range of motion and getting them to walk normal. So it's probably, you know, two months for someone is actively walking around, maybe a warehouse, but they're really not going to be doing any stooping or heavy lifting. So this is a challenging um, recovery for patients. Uh, most patients are in their 40s to 60s, and that, that's uh, there's there's life and there's kids and grandkids and a lot of things going on. And so, um, it, getting them to buy into the rehab protocol um, is really important because, from a technical standpoint, uh, you know, once you get these fine tuned, they're not really that challenging. Once you have a process, they're a pretty straightforward surgery. And so, uh, the patients have the hard part here. They have a lot of rehab they have to follow, and they have to be very. Uh, careful and cognizant of protecting this repair because you're asking you're asking for a lot. You're asking for a small area of the meniscus to heal down to the bone, um, and and hoping that they're compliant so they don't pull out the the sutures from that meniscus as it's healing into the bone that, that you've created that bleeding response for. Um, so this is a, a generalized guideline for the post op rehab protocol, but I spent a significant amount of time discussing this because the last thing I want is patients to get frustrated and say, well, you know. I don't understand. I'm three months out. Why can't I run? Well, the whole reason for that is the biomechanics and biologic healing is we want to protect what we have just prepared. So what are the outcomes? Again, we talked a little bit about this at the beginning. So we know that our outcome scores are improved. So the HSS scores are improved um, significantly postoperatively. Um, for example, 61.1 preoperatively to 93.8 at two years. That's a drastic difference in an improvement in patient outcome scores. Lysholm score significantly improved. Another study in 2015 showed improvement in functional and subjective scores after surgical repair. Um, the transtibial root repair for medial lateral meniscus root tears demonstrated significantly improved clinical outcomes at two years postoperatively. And we talked about things that, um, you know, increased age, increased BMI, cartilage status, and meniscal extrusion did not have a, a negative impact on short-term functional outcome, but they really don't, didn't help too much long-term. So, um, Age and age um, or equal to 50 years in extrusion did negatively impact 
um, patient activity level, though. So the Tegner scores were significantly impacted. So conclusion here. So we really don't want to miss these. These are the silent tears. They're difficult um, to pick up on. Um, again, most of the time for the medial meniscal root tears, they're not going to have a, um, a prodromal injury. 70% of the time, they're going to, it's a silent tear. The, the patients show up with maybe just some pain. Um, I think it's really important to understand a root tear, a complete root tear is equivalent to a complete meniscectomy. And hopefully we made sense earlier and had an analogy that maybe you can relate and, and describe to your patients. And then fix when appropriate. So if the BMI is over 35, if there's significant meniscal extrusion, um, if there's significant cartilage loss, then those are patients who really are not great candidates and they're just not going to do well with this surgery. As I tell my patients, we can always do the surgery. The problem is, is you're probably not going to do well from the surgery. Um, and there's better, better options um, uh, for you other than a root repair, um, which is more on the arthritic pathway. We do want to fix these early, as we talked about. Once you've had extrusion, uh, unfortunately, they don't, they don't do well. You can't kind of suck the meniscus back in. The biomechanical properties are permanently changed. So um, age is not really as important. I fixed 70-year-old um, patients with this that have no significant cartilage wear. Um, very active population. As we know, there's a lot of 70-year-old tennis players and pickleball players. Um, still a fair amount of patients that are running half marathons, even some full marathons in their 70s. And so if we can get to these early, um, you, age really isn't too much of deterrent as long as they meet the other criteria of minimal arthritis, minimal extrusion, BMI under 35. And we want to make sure when we are repairing these, we're doing these anatomically. I think we've shown some really good videos and pictures and descriptions of how we like to do that. Um, and um, we, we do, you know, I probably do 50 to 75 of these every year. Process is pretty fine-tuned. We're very uh, proud of what we do for our meniscal root, uh, repairs and, and enjoy the surgery because patients do well when they follow the uh, protocols. Again, we want to catch these early before extrusion, and then the patients need to follow these rehab guidelines. So um, that's the the, the um, end of the talk here, and we'll take on any questions at this point. All right. Our first question, if a patient had a root repair and reports she felt so good, so she started walking full weight bearing at two weeks, she had not been to PT since the first week after surgery because she was held for a DVT. She sent a message asking if she messed things up by walking. What signs and symptoms should we look for when she returns to PT to see if she had a retear? Well, that sounds, uh, that's a challenging question to answer. There's a lot of variables there. Um, the hope is, is that a little bit of weight bearing doesn't affect this. Um, but there's really no way to tell what's going on until further down the road when you four to eight months, for example, they start having pain and then you could repeat an MRI to determine if they had had a uh, healing or, or, or they had torn their repair. I mean, doing an MRI at two weeks is generally not going to be something we're going to be able to get approved even on a, on an insurance platform uh, status. So um, you just go back to your standard protocol and say, hey, let's back things off. Uh, hopefully a short period of weight bearing didn't have any implications. Um, hopefully they're still using crutches. Surprisingly, patients by two weeks feel pretty good after root repairs um, and they, they overall do pretty well. Um, their pain is moderate in the first week, but typically improves pretty quickly. And that is a problem that patients do feel good. So they start to do a little too much too quick. So we really have to refocus that first week back when you see them post up week one and say, you need to be non-weight bearing. But to answer that question, it's a challenging question to answer. There's no way to be definitive. I can't, as I tell my patients, I don't have x-ray vision. I can't look inside your knee and tell you exactly what your meniscus looks like um, without a new MRI. Um, and so it's hard to do that. And, and so uh, I, I generally am not going to get a, a new MRI just because they walked on it a few times. 